immediately following our regular service, um, which usually concludes with taking the Lord's Supper, we're going to be having baptisms uh, this morning. And so, if you're a parent and you're here, we're going to give a, um, a, a brief time, about five minutes, for you to run and get your children. Please do that, uh, because we do want the teachers to be able to come in and participate and, uh, and, and see the testimonies and, and celebrate with those who are being baptized. So go do that and then come back in. We'd love for you to stay. We're also having a potluck following that. If you're a guest here with us today, you are more than welcome to stay for that. Whether you brought something or not, please uh, know that you are welcome. Um, if you're not able to stay for that, we'd love for you to just come in and, and participate in the baptisms uh, in celebrating there. Well, if you're visiting with us this morning, I know we have visitors who are here um, for baptisms. First, this is not what my voice sounds like. Goodness, uh, please bear with me today. But in May, we finished a two and a half year study <clears throat> through the Gospel of Matthew. And we're currently going through a sermon series called We Believe, reaffirming our core beliefs through the ancient creeds. And we were looking at the Nicene Creed the past several weeks, and we're going to finish that up today. Our text is Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. So go ahead and turn there. I have never preached with a cough drop in my mouth before, but Kathy was so kind to share one. We're going to see how it goes. If I launch it, I apologize. But hopefully it helps. If you're able to stand, please do so and follow along as I read, beginning with Ephesians 4, verse 1. <clears throat> I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Just confess here, your word is truth. And as much as I want to assist in understanding what your word says, Lord, it is your word that is truth. Father, you are all powerful. I pray, Lord, that you would help this morning. That you would help the message of this text and what we're looking at to come through. In spite of my voice, whether you strengthen it or you don't strengthen it, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified. And that our hearts and our attention would be bent towards you and your word. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, we've come to the part in the Nicene Creed that some of you have been a little bit anxious about, 
the section that we are covering today is the end of the creed, which says this, in one holy, holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, as a reminder from last week, this section was not in the creed originally. The Nicene Creed originally ended with the words, and the Holy Spirit. The creed was updated after the First Council of Constantinople to reflect the deity of the Holy Spirit, and that took place in AD 381. It also added this section on the nature of the church, the ordinance of baptism, and the coming of the last day that we're looking at today. And that section begins, and one holy and apostolic, holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now, if you've been here since the beginning of this study, you may remember that we talked briefly about this the first week. The word Catholic there does not refer to the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, it can't refer to the Roman Catholic Church because there was no Roman Catholic Church when the Nicene Creed was written. Not yet. And we'll get to that. But the word Catholic simply means universal. So let's look at what the creed is saying there in that first statement about the church. One holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. The church is a beautiful picture of the grace of God. There is one church. Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body, the church. The oneness of the church originates from the one electing act act of God. He calls people to be His treasured possession. It is a single body, the body of Christ, a people from every age and tribe and tongue and nation and people set apart by God for His glory alone. The church has one head, Jesus Christ, and therefore one body. When Jesus is praying in John 17, he prays that his followers would be one just as the Father and the Son are one. That is Christ's desire for unity, oneness in the church. Not just cornerstone, in the church. Look again at verses 4 through 6 in Ephesians 4. There's one body and one spirit, just as you're called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, is there often division in the church? Yes, sadly, because we are sinful and broken people. But there is one church, and what unites us is infinitely stronger than anything that might divide us. The creed continues, one holy church. That next word is holy. In spite of the brokenness, the church is holy. Not because of the individuals who make up the church, but because of Christ, who is the head of the church. The holiness of church doesn't mean the absence of sin. If you're new to church, it's not saying that. It doesn't mean the absence of sin. The good news of Jesus is that He sanctifies the church positionally. Because they're united with Him and He is holy. And thereby we are credited with righteousness based upon the merits of Christ. Not upon our merits, but the merits of Christ. Ephesians 4, 12 through 16. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, we're not there. As the church, we're not there. We won't be there until we're with Jesus. But God uses the church to bring about more and more sanctification. And one day we will be with him and we will be perfect. But a massive implication to the holiness that is credited to us by Christ is that we strive as people to be different from the world. And we strive as assemblies who gather in his name, churches who gather in his name, to bring Him glory and to be set apart from the world. Michael Bird writes that the holiness that the church lives out can include things like fidelity in marriage, exhibiting humility and self-sacrifice, not euthanizing our elderly parents, defending the lives of the unborn and the immigrant, modeling cultural diversity, and on and on and on. We are one holy church striving to reflect the holiness of our King. And then the creed continues, one holy Catholic church. In the New Testament, the church is referred to mostly in local sense. The church in Galatia, the church in Corinth. And those refer to local assemblies like ours. Assemblies that gather in a particular area. But there are also references to the church as a universal or Catholic entity spread across regions with Christ as its head. One example of this is in the New Testament is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2. It says this, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Now, what's Paul saying there? He's referring to them as one chapter in Corinth among all of those in every place who call on the name of the Lord. It's the same of us. We are one segment. We are one chapter of the church. Ignatius of Antioch, who we've referenced back in the beginning of the series, who lived in the early second century, shortly after the apostles, said this, wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church, the church universal. We are united together with the church, believers from nations and denominations around the world. Now, I want to pause for a moment, and let's just talk for a moment. When does this distinction come about? If the word Catholic here means universal and doesn't refer to the Roman Catholic Church, what happens? And we're going to do a little bit of history, okay? I'm going to give... Josh Manor a moment to stretch his fingers and get his pencil ready, okay? Because he, like, writes like crazy during this part. So, you good? All set? Okay, good. So, as we've talked about already, the basic timeline of the Nicene Creed as we have it here is this. In 325, the Council of Nicaea originally gathers and forms the original um, Nicene Creed, And then in 381, the Council of Constantinople gathers, and there's a more elaborate form of the creed. It's what's added after the Holy Spirit. And then 589, the Western inclusion of the Philike Clause, which is just those words, and the Son, that we talked about last week. 
Now, I want you to think about something, okay? I, I'm a pretty nostalgic person, and by, my kid is nodding over here, my, by, by pretty, I mean like over the top, all of the time, a lot, don't play certain songs, or I will crumble into a nostalgic mess, that kind of pretty nostalgic, okay? But I want you to imagine something for a minute, okay? Imagine the amount of time between the Civil War and World War I, okay? Just think about all of that time between the Civil War and World War I. I get to see all your face expressions, those who can't stand history and those who love history right now, okay? I know all of you right now. That's fine. Now, if you're anything like me, okay, I love history, but I am ignorant of so much of it. I am now trying to catch up on a lot of it, okay? So if you're anything like me, I'm going to blow your mind, all right? Because that was 49 years between the Civil War and World War I. That's how old I am, okay? That's the part that blows your mind. I'm just joking. I'm, I'm teasing. 50 years is a long time. It's a long time. And a lot of things happen within 50 years. We got from the end of the Civil War to the beginning of World War I in 49 years. And what we've covered so far this summer, the resurrection, the early fathers, the heresies confronting the church in her first few hundred years, the councils of Nicaea and then Constantinople, the addition of the Philike Clause, that brings us to just over 500 years since Jesus left the earth. That's 10 times the amount of time between the Civil War and World War I. That's 50 years plus 50 years plus 50 years plus 50 years plus 50 years. Now, during this time, the Roman Empire is expanding politically, and with it, the church is expanding. The faith is continuing to be delivered to the saints. The Holy Spirit is working exactly as Jesus promised that he would work, and that we talked about in last week's sermon. But the reality is that ever since Constantine declared Christianity to be the official religion of Rome shortly before the Council of Nicaea, political and ecclesio uh, ecclesiological lines are heavily overlapped, sometimes almost indistinguishable. So we're going to talk just for a minute about political and ge geographical side of things for a minute, okay? The Roman Empire grew to be big spanning the entire Mediterranean beyond to neighboring countries, so big that there were actually two capitals of the Roman Empire, one in Rome, the western capital, and one in Constantinople, which is the eastern capital. And if you know your ancient geography better than I did, you may have noticed that the two councils we've learned about in relation to the Nicene Creed took place in the east, in fact, at both of the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople, the majority of the bishops in attendance were from the east, from places like Greece and Asia Minor, which is Turkey, Egypt, and Syria. So if you hear Rome or Roman Empire and think everything is centered in Italy or uh, the city of Rome or maybe even the Vatican, that's not really an accurate picture of what the massive geographical growth of the empire looked like at this time, or even where it was primarily centered. Maybe uh, you remember back in history class learning about the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 400s before the beginning of the Middle Ages. That actually only happened on the western side. After many invasions by many surrounding armies, but the eastern empire... The Byzantine side continued on for another 1,000 years after Roman fell. A thousand years. So, whether in the east or the west, God is faithful in the midst of all of this to preserve his church, one holy Catholic church, as evidenced by hundreds 
of local churches who affirmed the Nicene Creed and taught the faith of the apostles of Jesus. So there's the first 500 years or so of church history for you, okay? So when did Catholic come to mean Catholic as in Roman Catholic Church? We started to talk about this a little bit last week. We talked about that tiny little clause, the Philike clause, and the Son that was added to the Nicene Creed. That addition happened at a smaller regional council in the western side of the empire in Spain in 589. But it took time for it to catch on. Gradually spreading through the churches, primarily those in the west, but the eastern churches did not embrace this. They didn't embrace or affirm the idea that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Son in the same way that they affirmed the Spirit proceeded from the Father. And so over the next nearly 500 years, that theological disagreement on what seems to be a very insignificant doctrinal point along with other underlying political disagreements, culminated in what we call the Great Schism, which happened in 1054. And that formal separation of the church in the West and the church in the East. The Roman Catholic Church in the West and the Eastern Orthodox Church in the East. And it's a split that was so massive and so significant that it has never been restored in the past 1,000 years. And honestly, if we were to walk into a Byzantine church in, say, Istanbul, Turkey, or for that matter, the Eastern Orthodox Church in Columbus, there would be a lot that would feel very, very unfamiliar, probably uncomfortable for us. Icons and altars and clothing and imagery that we just don't understand. One major reason for that is because as Protestants, we come from the western side of the Great Schism. And if we're honest, we don't even think about the Eastern Orthodox Church. But it's good for us to remember that when we're praying for our Christian brothers and sisters in the Ukraine right now, whose homes and lives have been turned upside down in war, we're praying for members primarily of the Eastern Orthodox Church. So what happened to the church in the West after the Great Schism almost a thousand years ago? The Roman Catholic Church continued in Western Europe with multiple popes leading the church for another 500 years before various theologians began challenging some of the teachings and traditions that had developed in the Roman Catholic Church over the centuries. Traditions like requiring payment in exchange for being formally forgiven of their sins, traditions that had no grounds in the Bible, which by the way is now more readily available to be accessed and read thanks to translations in modern languages and the invention of the printing press in the 1400s, but, but probably the most famous of those theologians who challenged the Roman Catholic Church was a German Catholic monk named Martin Luther who with his 95 theses nailed to the door of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany in 1517, triggered the beginning of what we call the Protestant Reformation. 505 years ago this year. That's how long Protestants have been around. A branch from the Catholic side of the church, which a thousand years before had split with the Eastern Orthodox Church 700 years after gathering a council of bishops in Turkey to affirm Christian orthodoxy in the Nicene Creed that we are finishing up today. I want to close that historical portion by saying this again, what I said at the very beginning of the series. Why is this important? Why are we spending time this morning talking about history? Because church history is our history. And one of the reasons we're going through this series is because, frankly, we have ostracized ourselves from the world of Christianity. We don't see ourselves so often as a part of 
the church that God really is choosing from every tribe and tongue and nation and people and age and group and on and on and on. And that the church is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Church history is our history. One holy, catholic, and apostolic church. Now, what does that word apostolic mean? That's an easier one to answer than catholic. We hold to the true and authentic teaching of the apostles about the gospel. Or as Jude writes in Jude verse 3, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That ought to give us confidence that these church fathers who authored and affirmed the Nicene Creed were deeply committed to the authentic teaching of our Lord as passed on by His apostles. So when it came to affirming the legitimacy of the letters and the books that make up the New Testament canon, the church fathers were equally committed to apostolic authority in the Scriptures. And so all of the letters and Gospels in our New Testament were written either by an apostle or by someone who carried the weight of an apostle's authority because they ministered closely with or represented it on behalf of an apostle of Jesus. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. And then it continues, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. Now, Ephesians 4, 5 affirms this, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, this in the creed is orthodoxy. This is right belief. But what that looks like will vary in different assemblies of believers. What one baptism looks like will look differently. There are denominations and local church bodies like ours who practice baptism by immersion for those who have professed faith in Jesus. It's referred to as credo baptism. Credo like creed, meaning I believe. So baptism in response to belief. We at Cornerstone believe that baptism is an act of obedience that is done when someone is saved. We practice baptism by immersion as a picture of Christ's accomplished work in the believer's heart. And so today we're going to celebrate, as some say, I believe through the water of baptism. There are also some denominations and local church bodies who practice what is called Pado baptism or infant baptism. Now, I want to talk about this for a moment. We don't practice that. We don't believe that that is what the Bible commands us to do. However, the Nicene Creed is orthodoxy and it doesn't specify the means or method of baptism. And our brothers and sisters who do practice infant baptism often do so with a biblical framework. Look quickly, just a few pages later in your Bible at Colossians 2, just two verses, verses 11 and 12. Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. So they read this, and they see it as saying that baptism has taken the place of circumcision for the church, where Paul says, by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism. That's how they see that. And so, why was circumcision performed? Well, it was performed in the Old Testament to set apart a person as a covenant member of God's people, right? And when was circumcision performed? The eighth day of life. In other words, on an infant and so they see baptism as a symbol setting apart a person as a covenant member of God's people. Now, let me say here, 
I totally see where they're coming from biblically. I don't agree with them, but I absolutely see where they're coming from. That's just one of the reasons, by the way. And I'm sharing the details of that with you because so often we will divide, not just denominationally, we will divide emotionally and relationally from people who disagree about things like this. And yet they're brothers and sisters who have a biblical framework for why they're doing what they're doing. I understand why they're doing it, and I love them, and that's not something I would divide over, even though I don't agree with it. Here at Cornerstone, we accept into membership someone who comes from a background where they were baptized in a covenantal understanding and where it would break conscience for them to be rebaptized. We do that through a pleading of, we want you to consider the weight of what Scripture says here about baptism. But we don't, we don't divide over that. Now, what about the statement, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins? It says in Acts 2.38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important. Is Peter saying here that baptism is necessary for forgiveness? In other words, we're way, way more looking forward to what's going to happen later on after the service because we know what Peter says here is once these people are baptized, they're finally going to be saved. Is that what Peter's saying? It seems like it here in Acts 2, but let's look at his words later in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now, what's Peter saying there? He's making a comparison. He's making a comparison with, between baptism and the ark, Noah's ark. The question is, did the ark save Noah? The answer to that is no. We know the whole story. The ark doesn't save Noah. God saved Noah. But he used the ark as an expression of faith to bring about that salvation. Imagine having to build and then get on that boat for something as hard to believe as a global flood. In the same way, baptism is an expression of faith. Something we're commanded to do. But Peter clarifies about baptism there in 1 Peter. It saves you not as a removal of dirt. Now, Peter knows our hearts. He knows we're going to read the words, baptism saves you, and think, okay, this is the one thing you have to do to be saved, because he says baptism saves you. So he, he says, no, 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 not as a removal of dirt. Baptism is not redeeming you. Baptism is not washing you clean. It's an appeal. It is faith that saves, not the water. Baptism is a means of expressing that faith. Let's look at the end of the creed. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
Again, orthodoxy doesn't require a particular view of the Lord's return as right belief. There's no particular view of the end times that is orthodoxy. We believe in His return whenever, however. We look for the resurrection of the dead. The Bible teaches Jesus taught that a day is coming when He will return. And for that, we long. And He will be glorified. And those who have died in Christ will be raised, and those still alive will be raised, and we will all be glorified. And it says, the life of the world to come. Jesus taught and brought the kingdom of God. There is an eternal kingdom an eternal kingdom coming. We will live with Him forever, gloriously living with and before the Lord who saved us and made us the church with Eastern believers and Western believers, with Korean believers and African believers, with believers who trusted Christ at the age of seven and believers who trusted Christ at the age of 89. We will dwell together in glory and in the glory of the Lord forevermore. If there is one thing other than solidifying what we believe about God that comes from this series this summer, I hope it is more grace and peace and love for others. Others who also believe but maybe express it differently than we do. Jesus says they will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. And he doesn't just mean in cornerstone. He means the church. The church. How you are relationally with the church how you demonstrate his love for the church to one another. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. In one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We're going to go into a time where we take the Lord's Supper together. What a blessing. If you would consider that it's not just the body of Christ here at Cornerstone in Westerville, Ohio, but believers around the world who will partake of the bread today, who will partake of the cup today, all of whom remembering Christ, you died to make us one. You died, you gave your life that we could be forgiven of our sins. Your blood was poured out to redeem us. We unite with the church around the globe to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ as we proclaim, as Paul said, the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you for your goodness and your grace. You're so good to us, Lord. 
We're unworthy. We are unworthy of you, unworthy of your grace. You're so kind. We pray that you'd help us as we partake together as this local body in the bread and the cup. We pray for those who are here who know you, Lord, who have a relationship with you, that you would work in their hearts, draw them to yourself and to one another. We pray for those who, who don't yet know you, Lord. Then this time as the body comes and receives a piece of bread and a cup, Lord, I pray that they would consider you, that today would be the day they partake of you, not just symbols of you that remind us of you, but of you, Lord, the one who came and gave his life for saving us. We pray that you be glorified in it, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.